I'm Frank Moore, and um, I've known that I've been HIV positive since 1987. That's when I tested positive. And uh, you're stepping on the basil there. <laughs> this is the barn where I paint. I'm a painter. That's kind of a mess in here. Well, I'm quite nervous to introduce Frank Moore. Thinking about his work makes me think about what does it mean to be a great artist? What does it mean to be a successful artist? And what does it mean to be a good citizen? Frank Moore is a visual artist. And as a visual artist, he has a really accomplished career. There was a little profile about him in Newsweek. And I quote, in the Newsweek article, they said, Moore's new fame is likely to last a lot longer than 15 minutes. And I thought that was really interesting because he was someone who had basically been busting their ass for about 12 to 15 years before that quote. He's had films that have shown at Brooklyn Academy of Music, at The Public, at the Cinematheque in Paris. And not only that, he has gone beyond that. He has been behind the Red Ribbon and also been really active in the Archive Project, which is an organization that provides sort of professional support for people who, artists who are infected with HIV virus, and also helps preserve and document work of people who have uh, passed away from complications from the virus. So he has been unbound by media, and uh, he has not limited his political activity to just art, but it has gone to sort of all aspects of his life. So um, here he is. It was strange coming back here. It all sort of collapsed in on me. I was remembering where I had lived, who I'd slept with, everything. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's sort of moved through a lot of phases since then. And uh, as Paul pointed out, I've been involved with many different media. And I think it's been really important. All of that is fed into what I do now. I don't have a linear mind. I don't work in series. I have a mind that kind of spirals through time and has these little like zips that sort of branch off of the spiral as it's like moving through space. And it kind of sometimes can loop back and then go forward. just covering a lot of early ground where I was more or less keying off of materials. These, I found these glass eyeballs that came from a German taxidermy shop that were made in the 20s. And I just started making pictures with these glass eyeballs. I had read a, a book called The Secret Life of Plants and discovered that plants do have, in essence, a kind of vegetal nervous system in their sentient beings. So, you know, when you're cutting flowers, then essentially what you're doing is taking the genitalia of these plants and sticking them in a pretty pot and just thought, well, you know, what if somebody came and cut off, you know, like my dick and balls and put it in a pretty vase <laughs> to look at it because they thought it was pretty, you know, it's like, it's a strange human custom. This was a picture called Farewell, which you see a sort of deforested landscape going out behind this trellis. It was the beginning of, you know, I was beginning to think about dealing with AIDS subject and I, you know, had known many couples where one partner had been lost to AIDS and I was sort of thinking about this in a vague kind of way, but I didn't yet have, I didn't know how to put it into paintings. This was a kind of a portrait of a friend of mine who's a curator who comes from Trinidad and he lived in this gigantic loft that was filled with books, but there were so many books that he couldn't find anything anymore. And then there was a fire in his loft, he lost everything. And this is a Trinidadian fishing rowboat there, and these are all books cut in half, and running up the side of the left hand is the titles of the book make a kind of uh, concrete poem about this guy. It's called Library. Here are two more book pictures. This is called Falling Water. It's framed with a funk and wagon from Encyclopedia. That one's called Light Summer Reading. Here's another picture where I went out into a parking lot by my loft and I picked up everything I found in the parking lot. 
and then uh, painted it. The chicken bone, the cigarette, the condom, the cocaine bottle, all that stuff. It's a picture called Nursery, and it was spring, and I was feeling that in spite of the kind of bleak picture that the litter and so forth, all of this stuff suggested, there was this hopeful feeling that I somehow had that I think comes through from the, the crocuses. This is a picture where I began to explore more environmental themes called uh, wildlife management area. Wildlife management areas are essentially parks for hunters and fishermen and the wildlife is managed to provide sport. It just began to irritate me how our whole approach to nature and to the environment in general is managed from the perspective of its utility to us as human beings. Everything has a value or has no value because it has no value to us. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. I think that's wrong. This picture is a picture of me as a child. It's with a friend of mine, Hilton Owls, who was uh, also depicted here as a child, and it's called Debutante. They're taking a walk in a park. There are other scenes depicting the way in which our society has historically treated homosexuals. The interesting thing is, is that they almost always involved anal insertion to kill the person. And then around these like pedestals, which are giant pills, um, there are flowers blooming, and each of the flowers has an AIDS virus that's sort of depicted in various ways, but culled from illustrations from different scientific magazines and photographically reproduced inside each of these flowers where, in fact, the sex organs of the flowers are located. This picture is called Eclipse. There's an AIDS virus which is eclipsing the sun. All around the sun there are yellow rays which are computer manipulated sentences, all of which begin with the word fear. You know, it's like fear of mean nurses and tired doctors, fear of losing your insurance, fear of paying for other people's problems. Not just fears that people afflicted with AIDS have, but also the fears of society at large. You see a beach scene. These figures, they're immune system diagrams that I took and collaged into make these stick figures. This was inspired by a uh, number of articles I've been reading about doctors who were taking all expenses paid vacations to Caribbean, paid by drug companies in order to influence these doctors to promote their product. This picture is called Perline, and this was a wonderful woman who was a nurse to a guy I lived with for eight years before he died, and she was kind of like an angel, and so I tried to depict her that way. I, I actually took the presentation from a the Virgin of Guadalupe in uh, Mexico. It's often presented in this way with the halo of sun rays. She has a little black and white butterfly on her shoulder. She's holding all the instruments necessary to administer IV medication. And at the bottom, underneath the Get Well Soon, there's a menu which lists the menu that late stage AIDS people have available in the hospital. The real breakthrough for me, one of them, was when I began to try and create a point-for-point -point correspondence between my life and the image. Like, I tried to take every major element of my life, things I loved the most, hated the most, most concerned about, and move them in some form into the picture, and then see what it looked like. This one's called Arena. It's based on a wood engraving of a 17th century Dutch dissection theater. Someone pointed out to me that it could be the nine stages, nine levels of, of hell in books by, for example, Dante. In the center, you see a figure on the operating table. It's a portrait of this fellow, Robert. 
and he's having a catheter implanted in his chest. He's got a spirit or something is emerging from the top of his, his head. On the lower right, you see another patient being brought in. And on the upper left, you see a patient with a sheet pulled over being wheeled out. Above him, there's a Tibetan Lama sitting with a kind of Buddha floating over his head. Uh, and there's portraits of different people I knew, particularly a guy named John Giorno, who are sitting. And the whole thing is sort of cataloging different responses to AIDS. There's ACT UP or some activist group coming in on the upper right. There's uh, these skeletal figures which were around as sort of uh, models for students in that day, and they're carrying banners which carry uh, Latin sayings that relate to death, and they could be translated in various ways. There's some one that says, for example, that birth is the beginning of death, or death makes a hoe, like farmer's hoe, the equal of a crown. We are ashes and dust, and there, there's a whole series of them. They all come from like Virgil and Ovid, various Latin authors of note. This was something I got from a guy, Simon Watney, who was talking about how we make these elisions in language and how they affect the way we look at the world, and particularly in the case of AIDS. I found a classic case and I thought I'd reproduce it. They have the genetic profile of the HIV virus compared to the genetic profile of the simian immune deficiency virus, which is the version of HIV that monkeys get. But they're not labeled you know, HIV and SIV, they're labeled human and monkey. So what it seems like is they're comparing humans and monkeys. And this black professor is pointing it out, I think it's kind of uh, something that's been with us for several centuries now, where people are compared to animals for specific political or social purposes. And it can seem like one's being hypersensitive, but when you see enough of these examples and see how they affect people's thinking, you realize that um, they do have an effect. <laughs> this one is called Viral Romance. It's a past, sort of a pastiche of a Picasso lithograph that he did for UNICEF, where he has a hand holding a bunch of flowers. This hand is holding the flowers upside down, which is uh, kind of a distress signal in a sense, and the flowers are all viruses. And it's kind of my thinking of what a person with AIDS is offering to a partner. You know, it's that, the nature of that romance. It's called viral romance. This is called Untitled. And it's really a sort of a self-portrait at the time where the glasses have viruses, the clock face is a virus. The whole library is different books that I was reading about HIV and HIV theory, plague theory, Susan Sontag, all this stuff. And there's a Buddhist rosary there. There's a drawer full of drugs. The message is someone who's just obsessed, who can only see the world through AIDS. Everything is about AIDS. And the whole sense of time is AIDS time. There are a bunch of pictures I did where I was using the landscape itself as a metaphor. This one's called Hospital, and it was about my experience being in a hospital. There's an old surrealist device where you look at it one way, it's an Arctic landscape with ice flows, and you look at it another way, it's a human heart with the valves and so forth, and the valves are dripping blood there. I think that the paintings 
show a level of confusion that has elements of anger focused outward. There's an there are various kinds of uh, challenges to institutions, medical institutions, healthcare. Sometimes affectionate, like when there's this turkey made out of junk, um, and sometimes more pointed. This one's called um, Freedom to Share. In the um, around the time of the Depression, Norman Rockwell painted four paintings called the. They were called the Four Freedoms or the Five Freedoms. This picture is called The Great American Traveling Medicine Show. And there's a truck down there that says The Cure, and another truck over there that says A Cure. There's people hawking patent medicines. For the first 10 years of the epidemic, and even now, there are constant barrage of these treatments that don't work, fake medicines, frauds, all of this kind of stuff. AZT has been an example, which is now achieving like limited viability as a, in combination with other drugs, but it basically was not helpful to many people for a long time. The, the landscape has been totally raised, but the trees are enormous, which gives you a sense that there's some grandeur that's missing now. The farmhouses are sort of ramshackle. There's a woman selling copper tone on the billboard there. There's a giant syringe that's just resting on one of those logs, and you have this big placebo going through. It's basically about a healthcare system that's just not delivering. There are three carved wooden birds around it, one of which is dead, a bluebird, and uh, it's sort of like the canary in the coal mine thing. I got to be a better painter because I had to, because what I wanted to do, I couldn't do with the kind of technique I had. There is certainly a place for large, extravagant brushwork. I love that. Like the background of the uh, Great American Medicine Show was just like I took a brush and went like that, and that was it. Let it dry. But when you're trying to relate a lot of complex information, and some of which contradicts each other, and you know, constellate it in a kind of a meaningful way. You, you get involved with trying to represent very specific things that are very tiny. And that partly came because I love early American art. And one of the things that I love about early American art is that the figure is tiny in relation to the landscape. Because in America in those days, that was the feeling. So I like that idea to, to, to pull back, let's see the universe. But then when you see the universe, you have to make a person this big, and you have to know that he's a doctor, so you have to be a better painter. This one's called Aquarium, and it's just a somewhat bleakly humorous take on the fact that you take these medications, and you know I'm, I take them, I have AIDS, and you get a notice from the city saying that you, um, your water ha may have cryptosporidium in it. It's not filtered. And you begin to wonder, because you're, with one hand you're taking something that's supposed to help you, and with the other hand you're drinking it down with something that could make you ill. In the last picture there was pipe running around the whole frame. And it was there were three pictures I did like that, and it, it, it was because I was thinking about the fact that all the water on the planet is a closed system. It's continually circulating. So that, you know, what you piss today, you drink tomorrow. And uh, that has, comes up again and again through the work. This picture shows books again, but they're either going into or coming out of a toilet. Um, the, the toilet is sort of half a brain posed on a sort of spinal column, uh, and it has lesions on it. Um, but what you see is the uh, four bubbles there, five bubbles, and they're showing different forms of sex that were practiced, and, and the year in which they were practiced was, was on there, and there's a little positive mark indicating that it's positive. There's a bottle of AZT, there's a roll of toilet paper. There's uh, two signs that come off a barn. One is, says is a member of the Eastern Artificial Insemination Cooperative, and the one on the top says Serge Milker. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about this picture, you can talk to me later. Uh, <laughs>
this is, this is a long conversation. This, and, and it, partly it's long because I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get it in there. And so it's, it's very awkward. I wanted to do some figure paintings. The, this picture is a portrait of Lady Bunny, who's a fairly well-known New York gender illusionist who started Wigstock if you've heard of that. And it's called Birth of Venus. And it was after I'd seen a whole lot of Venuses in a show in Paris called The Century of Titian. And I decided to do a Venus for a gay kind of perspective. Again, you have the ocean washing in. You have these jellyfish that have viruses in them. You have sperm in the water. You have medical paraphernalia washing up. The medical paraphernalia here was quoted from an article about the New Jersey waterfront. There was a long period where medical waste was washing up on the shores there, and it was creating a, a big problem. Now they put booms out, you know, like a mile out at sea, to catch the waste before it comes in onto the shore. This picture is called Gulliver Awake. One of the things it sort of suggests is the difficulty or the trial of a young gay man who is in a landscape of tills and so forth, trying to pull himself free of societal constraints and constraints of illness and disease and so forth to have some kind of a life. This picture is probably the peak of the work that I was doing about AIDS, and it's called Wizard. It's a portrait of a doctor I was seeing for a while in France named Jean-Claude Sherman. And it's sort of an apocalyptic landscape, and I crammed into it like everything I knew. Some of it's funny, some of it's sad, some of it's really scary to me. The frame is uh, cast lucite and floating in the lucite are all the AIDS, major AIDS medications. The backing is uh, AIDS Treatment News, which is a major AIDS newsletter. It's a trippy, trippy picture. After that, I began to sort of back off and give it a rest because it got sort of intense. This one's called Angel, and in a sense, it's the uh, flip side. I wanted to get rid of all the color, get rid of all the junk, and just get empty. And that's what I did here. You see footsteps going into the light, and then you see footsteps sort of coming out of the light. The frame is resin cast feathers. So like the picture's an angel. And, you know, I began to sort of cool out a little bit. This is a somewhat recent picture. And it's kind of where my head is at now. It's called Patient. It's essentially like a hospital bed. And what I miss the most in the hospital is nature. It seems that nature is the opposite of hospital. And since we're 99% water, I figured that we've got all these beds full of water. It's kind of like uh, Heracliton flow. It's a cooler, calmer kind of appraisal. I mean, there's still an element of pain, but there's more of a distance there. That, there's a kind of trajectory in the pictures that I think is similar to a trajectory that many people I know have gone through.
This picture is called Everything I Own. It's a Buddhist mudra that is called mandala offering. And what happens is you make this gesture and a llama comes and he puts grains of rice in your palms. And you're supposed to imagine that each grain of rice is something you own, or even a person that you love and are very attached to. And then at a certain moment in this ritual, you just throw it all up in the air. And this very complicated thing that you've constructed with your hands just becomes completely free. And the rice goes everywhere. And it's a kind of letting go. The only problem I found is that, you know, I would throw it all up in the air, but it was still stuck on there. I couldn't quite get free of it all. Attachment. Some time ago, I got this fashion designer, Gianni Versace, saw some of my work, invited me to dinner, liked it, gave me, a, started giving me a commission. This was painted before he died. It was painted as kind of a provocation for him. You see the Medusa, which is Kate Moss, who was a favorite model of his. And one of her snakes has a hundred dollar bill, another one has a mouse. It's like they're going out with pocket money and, and a snack. Medusa is the central symbol of the Versace empire. It's on everything they make. And the idea was to bring this bloody symbol up into the present. Uh, there's a bottle of perfume that's been smashed. It's Gucci's Envy. He hated Gucci. There's a fax on the steps that he, we communicated by fax most of the time. There's a Polaroid, like from a fashion shoot, where she's getting her head cut off. If you knew his house on 64th Street, you'd know that this was a floor would be leading out to the front door. Anyway, he was a wild guy. I adored him, and you know, you could really push his buttons, and he loved it. And he commissioned two series of paintings for me. Some of them are still at the house, and some of them never got there because of his untimely demise. The first commission, we said, do garden. Let's do a garden. And the basic theme was to reduce people to the size of bugs. Because I'm like a big nature freak. So you see up there a guy interviewing a mayfly. There's a guy riding bareback on a caterpillar. There's a woman playing cat's cradle with a spider. And then there's this guy who's a Versace model who has Versace underwear on. He's getting a blowjob from a hummingbird moth. And you see the Greek key motif there, and you just imagine what's going on. Um, oh, that picture was called BJ. This picture is called Survival of the Fattest. These are all from around this place where I spend the summers upstate. Survival of the Fattest because in the insect world, if you're fat, you're beautiful. In the human world, if you're thin, you're beautiful. So we've got this Venus of Willendorf, which is the old human, very prehistoric symbol of fertility, who's been turned into like a cicada, and who reminds us that human beings used to think that fat was beautiful. And then below her, you have this very nice couple who are really sort of thin, and he's got fashionably long hair, and they're going for a little carriage ride. This was called The Client. It's Johnny himself, and he somehow created new iridescent wings for this praying mantis. Part of the idea there was that these fashion couture customers are real, can be, not all, but can be real monsters, and the praying mantis is known for consuming her mate after they've had sex. So you have to deal with the female praying mantis very carefully if you're a male praying mantis. Um, and fashion designers have to deal with their couture clients very carefully. All of the patterns on these butterfly wings are from his collection for men of that year. This picture was called Black Narcissus. 
and you see a guy looking at his reflection and he's seeing a bug. He's got these very sort of indolent wings and he's got a yarmulke on and then you see up in these lotuses you see uh, various shenanigans going on. There are two like butterfly boys who are like going at it. There's a guy on his back and there's a dragonfly that's resting on his feet and then the abdomen of the dragonfly bends around to his butt. When you see the eye of the dragonfly there, you're looking through two flower petals and a wing to see it. So that was sort of interesting. And the mist in the background is sort of spermatozoa. This was uh, called The Midsummer's Night and it was the last picture in that group and uh, they're riding fireflies. Generally, I hate commissions, but the great thing was is when you get out of your own head and your own preoccupations and your obsessions and your own neuroses and your concerns, and well, I don't know if you can entirely escape them, but you kind of find a ground, a mental space that's between you and the way you perceive the other person. And you can work in that space, which was, in this case, was more sexual, it was a little more playful, it was a little less threatening, it was definitely less painful, and it was, in, in a certain sense, more joyful, and that was great. This was the second commission I did for him. We did animals. This is a big cow. You see the Holstein has a map of the world on it. And basically, it was a whole meditation on the cow culture we live in. From 7000 BC to the present, our culture has been completely obsessed with cows. 90% of the grain that's raised in this country is raised to feed cows. We have everything from cowboys to Marlboro men. We have uh, a bull market. We have, you know, the whole, I could go on for hours, but I won't. This one is derived from, in a sense, a picture that Johnny had seen that was one of the pictures that made him think he wanted to get me to do stuff for him. It's called Stretch, because there's a very big white stretch limousine in the bottom of the picture that's just like the kind of car that Johnny would go to a national park in. And, you know, his sister went out to a dude ranch in Wyoming, and she went out for the first day riding in um, stretch lurex pants, a sequin top, and high heels. So you have an idea. And there's a thing called... Indian village there, and has a whole encyclopedia of Indian constructions. There are wigwams, there's teepees, there's roundhouses, there's hogans, there's mandan mud houses, there's northwest coast Indian houses, but they've all been somehow perverted. There's a, you know, wigwam is a restroom, northwest coast Indian house is a laundromat, and there's a sign saying casino, and it's sort of pointing off to an Anastasi recreation village. And it really was a kind of distress about the, the way in which the indigenous culture in this country and the national parks are both being warped and distorted in a sense to serve the desires of people today. And this tree is literally mutating to make a hot dog, a car key, a soft ice cream cone, a toothbrush, a pistol, a canoe, you know, arrow, whatever. The mountains behind them is all full of silkscreen money. These were both pictures for Johnny that, uh, these both pictures are called lullaby. They both are mammals, large mammals that I think most of us have only seen in zoos. The buffalo, which used to cover the plains like wildebeest cover the Serengeti, are no more. And they have receded into American folklore. But when I was growing up, I, my mother sung a lullaby to me, home on the range, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play.
where never is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. So that's one aspect, it's just somewhat nostalgic. It was more of a, like less of a head picture and more of a personal kind of emotional evocation. And I wasn't really too sure of why I was doing it, but I kind of didn't want to know. And the feeling was you know, getting back to a simpler kind of childlike state. This one was pushing it because the polar bear has pulled a seal out of a rip that he's made in the sheet. And through the rip, there's a pattern that when you see it in the painting, people have thought it was water, they thought it was mattress ticking, or they thought it was a static pattern on a video screen. It has a sort of other dimensional quality. But it's kind of a, a bed, which is normally a, a safe haven, which is been cast askew, and the pillows almost become like these giant creatures themselves. There's a polar bear emerging from one of the pillows the way a female polar bear emerges from a snowbank after nine months of gestation, bearing cubs and emerging in the spring. There are these bars that are sort of like zoo bars, but they're much too big for the polar bear. They might seem to be for the pillows. It's a little savagery, little blood coming along the sheet, but it's little. It's kind of like the savagery that we see in fairy tales. It's a little cruelty, the little thing like the ogre and Jack and the Beanstalk, whatever. It's really cute. He's just looking up and he's saying, oh, hi, you know, it's like, this is what he does. And I think it's really kind of sweet and it doesn't dampen the chaotic outburst of, of the torn sheets or the, the fact that the world is not always a very tidy, situation. You're saying the frames look very elaborate and handmade, and are they an integral part of the work? Norman Ruckwell, he once said, I would no sooner send a painting out into the world unframed than I would send my children to school undressed. And, you know, once you realize that you're making the kind of painting that eventually is going to have a frame, you have to think about whether you want to leave that to somebody else. And it's such a ball. I mean, the frame is the most fun part of the work, whether it's like books or twigs or lucite embedded with medical waste or, you know, straw. The cow picture was framed with straw that was gilded. Um, Whatever it is, it, it can kind of enhance, it can kind of contradict, it can, it can play all kinds of games that I find interesting, as well as doing the critical function of being the kind of way station between the world, the three-dimensional world, and the two-dimensional image. This picture on the left is a huge picture, and it was in the Whitney, is the picture that Johnny saw and I just made this giant picture and on on this very thin strip at the bottom is the entire history of the park. There's John Muir, there's, there's just everything. And also there's a stream in the Merced River and you see a canoe with the mother's dressed like a squaw and the father's dressed like an Indian chief here. Trees are turning into snakes, or rattlesnakes to be exact, which is, well, there was a big campaign to exterminate all rattlesnakes from the park. The feeling I have about this country, the feeling I have about the national parks, they're amazing, beautiful, fantastic. You know, they have all kinds of flaws and problems, but if you step back and look at them, they're, they're just truly mind-boggling. That concern with chemicals in the environment, I had gone up to Niagara Falls, which I saw as a child. It's where my, fam my father's family was from. And uh, I uh, had a great time. There's this boat that you see the little boat down there. It's called Made of the Mist, and it takes viewers up the river into the falls. You know, I'm very uh, 
chemical conscious because I have AIDS. And you get into this thing, you're completely enveloped in this white mist. It's like going through a cloud and you're breathing it all in. And I began to wonder what exactly am I breathing? So when I got home, I began to call some people like Great Lakes United and the Toxic Release Inventory of the Environmental Protection Agency. And I got a listing. It turns out Niagara Falls is one of the most polluted bodies in the United States. It has 360 extremely toxic chemicals that are being monitored and a great many others that are not being monitored. Um, all the smoke there is actually made up of hundreds of chemical formulas that are silkscreened one on top of the other. And it's because the falls were a very early source of electrical power. So a huge chemical industry sprang up around the falls. And that's where we have Love Canal. Love Canal is just a 15 minute drive from here. A guy named Richard Goldstein, who's a <coughs> critic, once said that what he thought I was trying to do was present an ecology of health. The fundamental question is, can you have a healthy person in a polluted or degraded environment? You know? And can you have a healthy, pristine environment when the people and their mentalities are degraded and polluted? It's just not possible. This was a, a Niagara. In this case, you see the little spectators at the bottom. There, I took all the specific chemicals that cause genetic damage and I made them into a spiral helix. You see spiraling up in the smoke. On the shoreline here are soluble representations of alchemical symbols for many of the chemicals that are depicted in the, the stream there. It was kind of a reflection for me that alchemy was a science that was ultimately devoted to the perfection of man and it had a very highly developed spiritual dimension. It was trying to turn, turn people into um, pure beings. I mean, one of the alchemical sayings is that gold is the shadow of the sun and sun is the shadow of God. And uh, they were always trying to turn man into gold, into a philosopher's gold or whatever. At any rate, that, that system is gone. We now have a chemical system that operates without a moral guideline in many cases, but it's still fabulous. I mean, Niagara Falls is still a stunning place to visit. Uh, even though 60% of the water that used to go over the falls is now being diverted to make hydroelectric power. The most recent big picture that I completed it's called Emigrants with an E, and it depicts um, two friends of mine who are carrying a flag that is <clears throat> the exact proportion of Jasper John's flag at the modern. That flag was painted over with encaustic over newsprint, and it's all current articles of his day. This one is, um, aside from being bubble wrapped, all of the um, newspaper, all the reproductions, black and white reproductions, are reflecting the kinds of issues that are in the art that we're exporting today. I mean, nowadays, American art, like in Europe, it means Maplethorpe, Keith Haring, you know, uh, all sorts of people who are exploring um, the dark side of American culture and, in many ways, much more honest viewpoints about the country. And uh, this is what we're carrying overseas. These are like two art movers, but they're also representing one's, one's Chinese, one's Spanish, um, that is throwing into question this whole immigrant thing we have now. The question of if you're a Chinese person who's American and you move to China, what are you? You know, you're an immigrant in China, but what are you, you know, it's just like this whole insane thing that we're developing about who people are. Um, they're walking on water. It's, it's uh, kind of a, a double kind of parody. It's, it's sort of elevating art movers who I think get a raw deal in many cases and are never really acknowledged, but they sort of move the whole industry. And uh, there's also the idea that in Renaissance Italy, for example, when a major re religious picture was completed, they would parade it through the streets of the town um, there was a, a kind of a, a idea that art was a sacred vessel of communication. And uh, 
uh, so it's sort of throwing that into question now. They're carrying, say, uh, a pseudo Jasper Johns. Um, how sacred is it? Also, the frame is a million zillion different kinds of frames that are used to frame pictures from different periods, Edwardian, Victorian, whatever. And uh, it's about the clash of cultures that are taking place in this country artistically and in other ways. You know, you have to face it that when you're a painter, even if you're a successful painter, you're operating in a very restricted universe in terms of your audience. And it's not to say that paintings don't have a tremendous influence, but I think that influence is something that in many cases grows over time. So you kind of have to give up the instant gratification of mass acclaim now and not worry about the long-term resonance. Let that take care of itself. There is a point at times when I feel like, okay, you're working in a, a black hole here. You know, in, in, in practical terms of the 8 billion people or 10, well, how many billion people there are in the world, nobody's going to see your work. And, uh, you know, you're, you're getting all these messages that painting just isn't important. Because really, why are you doing this in the first place? There's that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. It's like if you have a talent, you want that talent to bring light into the world to help everybody else, if you can. This little light of mine well, I'm gonna let it shine Oh, this little light of mine well, I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine Well, I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine Down in my heart Well, I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine What you're actually seeing through that little hole is such a tiny part of what's actually going on all around you. <laughs> 